right, hello wine drinking people. Today is Wednesday, October 13th. We're back for what I drank yesterday. We had a pretty busy day here in the store and a busy night. A lot of drinking done yesterday here. We got a lot of events going on. So, um, you know, I'm willing to sacrifice my body for my uh, my people, my wine drinking people. First up, we had uh, <clears throat> our good friend from Henry O. Uh, David, which uh, he brought in a few of the new releases from uh, the Champagne, the Brut, the uh, Brut Chardonnay, Per Chardonnay, um, Blanc Souverain, and then the Rosé, which all of these wines are very elegant and refined. I wouldn't say they're very rich like the Bollinger style. They're not really light like PJ style, but somewhere kind of fall in between there. This wine has some, the, the Brut Souverain has lovely toasty smoky notes to the bouquet. Pretty uh, complex, rich with some hazelnut and light ginger spice there. Around 60% Chardonnay and 40% Pinot Noir. Usually 20% reserve wines going back as far as four or five years going into this wine. Lovely richness on the tongue with a kind of a fresh dough and nutty quality coming through on the finish. Lovely pear, apple, and citrus fruit though. And that smoky character lingering through to the end. Very nice brute style champagne. Next up, the uh, Chardonnay Blanc Souverain, which I love Blanc de Blanc champagnes. For me, they're some of the best food wines. They got some of the most uh, weight on the tongue. Uh, really nice almond and vanilla cream notes on the nose with fresh apple and pear-like fruit. A light smoky quality here as well. A bigger, more complex wine on the tongue with this lovely creamy texture. Uh, lovely smooth, creamy mousse and a wonderful backbone of acidity holding everything together here. The Blanc Souverain, excellent also. All right, then the Rosé Brut. Rosé is one of my favorite styles of champagne. If I'm drinking champagne nine out of 10 times, or maybe not many, maybe six out of 10 times, it's Rosé. And I love that strawberry and red cherry fruit, kind of red plum notes. Uh, this wine had that a little red licorice spice as well and some rose petal floral notes. On the tongue, this wine had that lovely red berry fruit showing there as well, strawberry uh, cherry, and this lovely elegant mousse, this lovely creamy texture on your tongue. One of the things I love about champagne, wonderful freshness, 70% Pinot Noir, 30% Chardonnay, and this wine is made by making a still red wine and blending it in with the white. Uh, most people do that today in champagne. The other way you can make a rosé is to use a Saunier method, which is to let the juice sit in contact with the skins for a short period of time, but it's much harder to get a consistent product using that method. All right, next up, well, the Henry O family bought Bouchard a couple of years ago, and uh, so we had some Bouchard Perry Fees wine from the 2008 vintage. The only problem with 2008, 2009's following it, man. People are waiting for these 2009's chomping at the bit. We got our first tasting next week with Louis Jadot's 2009 barrel samples. But this Savini Le Bone, it was not typical bone, maybe not as hard edge, a little softer, lovely raspberry and red cherry fruit, Pretty bouquet of dried flowers, a little bit of that gravelly, minerally note you get from bone, and some hints of fresh earth, but uh, smooth and silky on the tongue, rather light and fresh, and very drinkable. And uh, some nice length on the finish, but like I said, I don't know if I would guess that wine was from bone in a blind tasting. Next up, Nuit Saint George. Uh, Village Wine 08, and this was typical Nuit St. George. Uh, pretty bouquet of red cherry rhubarb, fresh plowed earth, a little underbrush nuance, and some black spice on the nose. Nicely structured. Nuit St. George, to me, has great structure. That's one of the signatures of this Village Wine. Uh, maybe a bit tight at the moment, but has all the right stuff here. Classic Nuit St. George. Very good. All right, well, next up, we had the owner of Col de Orcha in. Uh, Francesco Cinzano, what a nice man. This is the first time I've got to meet him. I do have a lot of friends in Montalcino, one of my favorite areas of the wine world. And uh, this was the gentleman that was the head of the consorzio when the scandal happened. And, uh, you know, he didn't want to talk about that too much. He said, look, man, there's only two producers that have really been cleared of the 92 people being investigated. And I know you think, you know, some of the top producers aren't in on this, but he didn't want to lead into too much of who the actual producers were. But like I said, a very nice man and somewhat opinionated about how things should go in Montalcino. And, hey, these guys all are part of the consortium there. They're not forced to be. And they all got to vote and decide whether they wanted to keep Brunello de Montalcino's 100% Sangiovese. And they all did. So why the hell did they put peanut butter in the chocolate? Uh, why did they put can Cabernet in the Sangiovese? I don't know. Well, like I said, he assured us that his wine has no Cabernet Sauvignon at all in it. And uh, the first wine that we have, uh, the Spirizzi, well, I'm sorry, this wine does have a little Cabernet and Merlot in it, but it's not Brunello. It's a Super Tuscan. And um, 
This means uh, spice box. Spice box is what the name of this wine means, and it's a blend of Sangiovese, Cigniello, which is one of these ancient varietals that he's decided to resurrect from the dead. Um, but a very nice wine, a little bit Petit Zero, Syrah, and Cabernet in there, kind of a kitchen sink blend. Usually I don't like these, but had lovely black cherry fruit, fresh plowed earth, typical kind of Tuscan uh, bouquet to this wine, but then some of those new world uh, uh, fruit, fruit forward nature notes, and then uh, some lovely uh, soft tannins in this wine, and nice freshness. Really nice little everyday wine, the uh, Spizieri. Okay, next up we have the Rosso de Montalcino 2007, another great vintage in Montalcino, this 2007. And two, 1973, that's when they purchased the property, they only made Brunello. Well, a couple years later, they were one of the first people to make Rosso de Montalcino in 75 because they wanted to make their Brunello de Montalcino better. They wanted to make a wine that was drinkable, more drinkable young. This wine has that lovely bouquet, of some lovely barnyard earthy notes, dried mushrooms, red cherry, red strawberry fruit, and a very soft and smooth on the palate, drinking very nice and echoing some of that earthy and some of those uh, mushroomy notes onto the finish. Really nice. And then the Brunello de Montalcino 05. 05 is not considered a great vintage, but you know, they don't have bad vintages in Montalcino. It's kind of like Napa Valley. Somewhat protected from uh, heavy rainfall at harvest. And uh, the off vintages, well, the lesser vintages like 05, 04, and 06, considered outstanding vintages, are just going to drink better young. They're good wines to drink while you're waiting for your 05 fives or 04s and 06s to mature. This wine had a little bit of that old leather saddle kind of underbrush note to it, fine herbs, dried porcini mushrooms, classic Montalcino in my opinion. And then uh, this wine's actually from the southern area of Montalcino, uh, a little bit leaner and more drinkable, a little less uh, acidic wine, uh, but very typical old school Brunello, really nice and uh, very drinkable at this stage in its life. The 01 Paggio Alvento Single Vineyard Reserva. Wow, man, this wine is a blockbuster. It features older wines located on a higher ridge at a little bit higher elevation also. So a little lower yields just due to that a 25-year-old vineyard, a really historic vintage, and uh, th this 01 vintage still needs time. This wine is really big, a wonderful bouquet of fine herbs, dried meats, an array of fresh earth, kind of spice box, a good deal of strawberry and red cherry fruit, lovely concentration and richness, dried flowers, excellent structure. This wine is going to last years in your cellar. And then last up, the 1980 vintage Cold Orcha Brunello Reserva. Well, this is something they do. They release older vintage wines, and they've got a box out now with 79, 77, and 1980. 80, not a great vintage in Brunello, but neither 77 or 79. But hey, we had the 77 uh, uh, Beyond Asante at our vintage Brunello tasting a few months ago. It was still drinking very nicely, as was this 1980. And uh, this wine has got that lovely mature fruit, that lovely uh, earthiness that you get from Brunello. A little bit of that tar, dried rose petal, and uh, really aged to perfection. A wonderful little wine. Hey, I lied. That wasn't the last one. They do have a property in Chile also. And uh, this was started in 1990 when he first visited the pro Francesco first visited uh, Chile. And today uh, they're making some fantastic wine. This is from the Mall Valley. And I actually visited, oh, actually drove through this area. I didn't visit any wineries from there on my way to Termas de Chian from the Colchagua Valley, a little further south from there. But uh, this wine has a little bit of that typical Chilean terroir that you get. Too much of it to me is not pleasing. But uh, this wine, very polished, really nice. Fresh herbs, fresh earth, red cherry, uh, red currant, and black cherry fruits. A lovely, smooth, round tannins with this wine. Had great structure. Uh, 2006 vintage. You definitely could you need a little use a little time in your cellar. But the wine really nicely balanced. You could drink it today. And that's what I had to drink in the store yesterday. I'm your host, Andrew Lampazone, signing off for the Wine Watch, saying remember, always drink the good stuff first.